you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. As my voice may give away, this week's Mysteries and Monsters comes from my sickbed, but I'm still delighted to welcome back author and investigator Anna Maria Manalo to discuss her haunting tale of a young girl trying to find her father in Nazi Germany in The Way Through the Woods. This incredible true story of Krista shows us the real horror of life under the Nazi regime and her fleeing from the Third Reich. She seeks refuge in the Bavarian forest. The forest, however, has its own secrets, and as both Krista and her father discover, the shadows play host to the supernatural spirits who also bear the scars of war. It's a powerful and emotional account that shows us that ghosts are not the scariest thing we can often encounter in life. But before that, and before my voice gives up entirely, (laughs) don't forget you can support the show on Patreon by clicking on the link in the show notes, or you can go to patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters for $4 a month. A big thank you to my latest Patreon, Sloan. Welcome to the club. This month there'll be a QA and a once I'm able to talk properly, and a couple of other bonus episodes just for Patreons. So if you don't want to miss out, make sure you sign up by clicking the link, or as I said earlier, go to patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. Mysteries and Monsters is across all social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and you can subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. You can also find the mysteriesandmonsters.com website, where you can now find your Mysteries and Monsters merchandise, t-shirts, mugs, stickers and more. As always, a big thank you to my brother Dean Bestall for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr from the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. So, as I head back to my sickbed, let's head to Germany, in the company of Anna, and this incredible true story. This week, on Mysteries and Monsters, it's a warm welcome back to Anna Maria Manalo to discuss her fabulous new book, The Way Through the Woods, a chilling true tale of survival in a time of upheaval, fear, and damning repercussions. Anna, welcome back to Mysteries and Monsters. How are you? I'm very good, Paul. I'm glad to be back. It, it, it's uh, It's been a chilly weather here, and, and we've been going up and down uh, with rains and then frost and then rains again, and it's up to about 60 degrees here in the U.S. East Coast. Yeah. Otherwise, I, we're good. Yes, I, I feel you. Yes, we. Uh, where I live, I was able to watch people using getting their uh, Christmas sledges and toboggans out last week. And then it's rained ever since then, but there's more snow on the way, so no doubt I'll be able to uh, watch them flying and hurtling down a very steep hill near where I live, which is the best way to watch sledging, I, in my opinion. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, this new book, and I, I have to say, as we were chatting before we, we dove into this, it, it really caught me unawares. Now, obviously, we've spoken a couple of times and we've got to know each other over over the time I've been doing the show. I suspect you you sneaked up on me with this one because I wasn't expecting this book to be so compelling, so gripping. And it, it literally really frightened me at parts because I know a little bit about the history of the Second World War and what certain people had to go through and, and the losses and tragedies that unfolded across Europe at that period. It's a surprisingly challenging book because I think it really makes us face up to the facts of just how cruel people can be. Were you surprised, Anna, when you pulled it together that it it still seems so very raw for the lady that shared this experience with you? It was raw and it was very... um... What can I say? Uh, with the passage of time, I think at some point uh, when she was telling me this story, she was just telling me as if she was picking up clothes, uh, I hate to say. But uh, I could tell from, you know, she was very reluctant 
without giving it a spoiler, at some points in her narrative, she was really very reluctant to tell me what happened to her eventually as she approached this clearing in the forest. And Paul, I think you might know what I'm talking about, what what particular chapters. Yes. Um, but let me give you a, a bit of a background mm-hmm. on this person who uh, she's 90 years old today. Next April, she'll be 91. Yeah. Um, her memory is still very, very good. I would have to say uh, she still drives her own car. She gets around pretty good for someone her age. Uh, and the environment she is in uh, is very conservative. And what I mean by that is she's close to her church. Uh, she is very much a Roman Catholic. Uh, and as Roman Catholic goes, uh, not all of us, obviously, I am as well. But for, for the most part, uh, I, I don't know how much they believe or want to discuss topics about ghosts and the afterlife. Mm. Uh, And this book centers on ghosts and things of the night uh, that you see uh, and are more likely to see in places of tragedy. Yes. So not to go on and on, but I met her actually about a year after I completed my first book, uh, the one we had discussed in previous uh, shows, Porto. Mm-hmm. And it came to me, and, and I was just telling this at another bo- podcast, it seems like these people fall into my lap. Uh, you know, it, I don't have to go very far, but this one, I went an hour. I was invited uh, an hour away of all places to this huge Chinese restaurant <laughs> to celebrate a birthday. And it wasn't her birthday. It was a family member uh, on my husband's side. They were celebrating a, a, a big birthday. I think it was age 50 at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she happened to be one of the people in attendance. So it was, I think, 2018, 2017, perhaps. One of the guests there who knew me and knew about my first book said to me, you know, you really need to talk to this woman. Mm. Uh, because I think she has a story to tell you. And, uh, you know, at the time I was also, you know, looking at UFOs, uh, ETs, abductions. I thought she was going to tell me a story about an abduction. Yeah. So as it goes in the process of the evening, we had the entire restaurant to ourselves. I ended up actually taking a table, sitting next to her. Mm. So as people were being introduced around the table, and I said, oh, I think uh, you're the woman with the story. And uh, she was already getting on in age. She was already around 80, 86 or 85. Uh, She almost fell literally on my lap (laughs) as she (laughs) tried to sit. So I tell people this story fell on my lap. (laughs) (laughs) Literally. Literally. Uh, literally. Uh, and so in the course of the evening, you know, people were mingling and things like that. But she stayed with me. Mm. She said, I've been told that you write and that you're very open about things that people won't discuss. And so, you know, she went on to talk about how she survived World War Two, mm-hmm. how she, in fact, you know, and, and, and it's in the book, in the opening of the book. She didn't know about Hitler yeah. until she heard his voice on the loudspeaker. Mm. And in the little village that she was in, and she was perhaps about maybe three years old at the time, they put up these loudspeakers, attached them to the roofs of the houses mm. in her little street. And she said, Mom, who is that man who is always angry, (laughs) yelling, you know, uh, on the roof? And her mother said, it's better not to discuss, but his name is Hitler. And he he is a very angry man. And you need to mind yourself what you say when you hear. And she didn't know what that meant until years later. And a girl came to live with them. 
And apparently the, the girl was the neighbor's daughter who was just down the street. Uh, there were soldiers who were wearing these bright uniforms, according to her. They were always so well dressed and they would march and it would scare her. You know, she would hear the boots coming down the street. Hmm. And one time she dropped her doll and her mother said, go right in. And she said, mom, my doll is still on the ground. And she's like, no, we'll come back for it later. Her mother didn't even want her out in the street when these soldiers came. They were Nazis. Hmm. So the girl came to live with them, but she didn't understand why the windows had to be shut or why they couldn't be loud or why the girl had to end up in this one bedroom and hide. Mm -hmm. You know, she said it was like a closet where they put all the linen. And she said, oh, mom, she won't be able to breathe there. And so that's the beginning. Yeah. That's the beginning of the whole thing. And I kept in touch with her. Uh, and, uh, you know, as it went on, I, I would call her on the phone and get parts of her story. And then eventually she got to the part that was to me the most unbelievable yeah i think as someone with a with a bit more knowledge than than the average person and i don't mean that in a in a big headed sense i've i've studied the second world war um academically um and mm -hmm. the build up of it so from hitler's ascent to the uh, to the head of the german state in 1933 and obviously the the ramifications and the repercussions of everything that was going on through that period especially obviously living in in england in the uk here mm -hmm, it's, some, mm -hmm. it's something that's obviously ingrained into our cultural dna here Anna. and it's it's very interesting when i'm reading those first few chapters and this lady's explaining this kind of you can you can see the sense and the changes in the list this little town where she lives uh, I think, as you mentioned in the book, it's about 55 miles away from Frankfurt, which is probably one of the most famous German cities outside of, of Germany, I would imagine, for most people who've, who know German cities. And it's very interesting to see these changes, these subtle changes, as you refer to the speakers. So Hitler's voice could be heard in all parts of the country as he tried to instill his beliefs and power across the country in in regards to what he wanted to achieve and get everybody involved in. And you can see the changes in the in the locality and the way that the neighbours are with each other. And obviously, as things develop, you, we become aware of, of the sort of filtering of the German population of who's classed as German and who's deemed to be unfit. And it, it's still one of those things that I think often when we look at history, we can... We can look at it in a very blasé way in regards to things like this. And I know, obviously, coming from where you come from as well, there are some parallels with things that went on out in the Pacific with the the Japanese and their occupations of several countries out there as well. And it's it's remarkable to me sometimes when people just presume that it was it was all of Germany that was involved in this and, and it clearly wasn't that that wasn't the case a lot of Germans were very uncomfortable with what was going on a lot of Germans were deemed not to be German enough under this kind of new regime and um, I think it's always good to have a real insight to what the average German family had to deal with because I think often we can kind of paint people of that era all in a very broad brush stroke and assume that everybody was was buying into to what Adolf Hitler was prescribing for the German population and um, I know and I know if you anybody who looks into it properly Anna they will see that a lot of German people were deeply uncomfortable deeply unhappy and completely disagreed with the the direction that the country was to was unfortunately about to take. And, and you know, Paul, that is a great point because a lot of books that I've seen out there talk about um, what the Germans per se are doing to uh, the Jewish population, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, underneath all that, there are these Germans who don't agree with 
the Third Reich. They don't agree with the policies. They are really internally rebelling uh, to the best that they can. Uh, and this family is an example of that. There's not too many books out there that talk about this particular segment uh, of people, let alone the uh, things that had happened in the woods mm. uh, and, and what is still, I think, happening today in those German woods. This gave me a glimpse. And it's, it, I have to say, I've been very fortunate because if you recall from the first book, I've touched on the hauntings uh, caused by the tragedies because of World War II and the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Now I get the contrast what happened uh, in, in the Western society on the end of Europe, mm. uh, what happened and what kind of hauntings we are seeing. Uh, on that end. Yeah. So I sort of now have an understanding that overall, universally, the human spirit, when it is torn and uh, destroyed and traumatized, really does leave an imprint on the ground without giving away the book. I mean, the imprint is so devastating that it lasts. You know, I've heard people talk about some of the concentration camps. Mm -hmm. uh, some which are still standing because they have tourists coming in and they want to not be forgotten what has happened to these people. Yes. Uh, you know, nothing will grow around it. Nothing, uh, you know, it, it's just very eerie at nightfall mm -hmm. and no one will stay there after after dark for good reason. But anyway, it, to go back to this, I um, it, it took me a while to get out of her. What was happening when she was recounting this to me, she was kind of trying to detach herself. And for good reason, Paul, because, you know, it broke apart the entire family. Yeah. And in the process, she was really grappling to put them back together. Yeah. Which began her voyage. Uh, and she is a very courageous young girl. She was only 14 years old when she embarked on this. And she took it upon herself to confront the Gestapo woman mm. who had forcibly had her stay in her home. And I don't know, Paul, if you recall, these homes they were staying in were not even theirs. Yes. They murdered people in order to stay in these homes. Yeah. I, I could not believe it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the thing about... Uh, the the book and the and the opening few chapters because obviously we we learn about this young young lady's life and how it changes over this period of life and the ramifications that that occur for not just herself but as you mentioned her family and the break apart of the family unit the breakdown of relationships of friendships of a sense of belonging a fear of not knowing what to say often this is this is something that I think is very palpable in the book is that for a lot of people they were terrified of you know even just in a normal conversation of saying the wrong thing because saying the wrong thing would mean you'd get a knock on the door and you'd disappear and that would be that yes yes and the, the part that to me was terrifying was that they were being indoctrinated at a very young age mm-hmm and she said it was mandatory, even though her father didn't agree, her mother didn't agree. They had no right over the children. When they turned 12, they were mandated to attend the Nazi youth uh, classes. Yep. Uh, so she became part of that. And then she became a teacher. Mm. She was so good at it. They made her a teacher, not realizing her parents were against it. Um you know, and all the things that they were doing, you know, uh, under the cloak of being a quote unquote good German. Yes. Uh, and that's where the tragedy struck and started to unravel. It was a child from the same class that she was teaching that gave her mother away. Mm, yeah. I think that that's the other aspect of all this as well is that sometimes it, as I referred to, we can look back at this period of time and think, oh, well, if I was there, I'd do it this way or, or 
I wouldn't, I can't believe this went on. But it's just how it was because at the end of the day, people wanted to survive. And for a lot of them, they would just do what they thought they needed to do to be good citizens of the new German era, to establish themselves, to get noticed. And essentially, for a lot of them, to keep themselves safe from suspicion. Because like I said, you know, you, you could do the slightest thing that could t be taken completely out of context by yes. the hierarchy and they would deem you as unsuitable or a problem, Anna, and away you would go. And it, it's something that people, I think, sometimes can look back at it and think, oh, well, I wouldn't do that. For a lot of people, it was the only choice they had. It was, you know, without wishing to brutalise it even further, it was often kill or be killed for people. They had to sort of just... You know, point people out, and as we refer to, you know, the the, the members of the community that were earmarked as as being un-German, a lot of the Jewish people were were made to wear drab clothes with stars upon them. People who were deemed to be unpure of blood, or anybody who suffered from a a challenge mentally or physically, were deemed unsuitable. It was a purification of what they believed to be the master race. And nobody was safe, sadly. No, nobody was. It reminded me so much of um, communism in one way, because you, you couldn't be different. You couldn't think differently. You had to be, quote unquote, mentally in a uniform. Mm. And, and that was what was very stringent about this whole thing. She had to go about things as if she was teaching the books that were given to her by this Gestapo woman. And I made fun a little bit of the woman's name. It really isn't her real name. I have no idea if this woman's relatives are still around today. So mm -hmm. I had to fictionalize a lot of the names. Yes. But she recalls the books and um, immediately she was shocked herself. Even at 12, she knew it was wrong what she was doing. Mm -hmm. And every day that she had to do it after school and take the kids out, she would pretend she was teaching them. And she was, in fact, just telling stories and jokes that had nothing to do yes. with the books. <laughs> 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 and then finally, at some point, she was caught, um, you know, caught in a kind of a. I guess you could say, okay, I'm going to reprimand you, but you're one of my best. Uh, at this point, she was considered a mentor, a leader. So they were kind of treading lightly on her and until, of course, the mother was caught. And then they decided they would take whoever they needed and eliminate who they didn't need. Mm -hmm. And that's where the story really begins, is what happens when these things unravel. Um, and, and Paul, I, as a side, I wanted to let you know, I shared the manuscript with a couple of people because they wanted to preview it and then review it. Mm -hmm. When the listeners uh, look at this book, they will see some of the reviews in the first couple of pages. All these people thought this was a fiction novel. Mm. And, you know, there's two kinds of novels. There's fiction and nonfiction. But because the stories were so unbelievable, they thought it was a novel mm. until I started telling them, I'm going to send you a couple of the pictures of this elderly lady as a child so you can see what she looked like at the time. Mm. And they were appalled. They said, are you kidding? This is this is true. And I said, yes, this truly happened. Hmm. And she is alive today to tell the story of what she encountered in those woods. Hmm. It is interesting as well, because the book essentially is in two parts, because first of all, it's it's a frightening book on both sides of this situation. Anna, because the first half of the book really deals with the frightening situation and the horrors of war and the horrors of fascism and the rise of fascism and the fear of being picked out for whatever reason, questioning, being different, being Jewish, uh, being of a different denomination, looking different, behaving different. I mean, even, you know, even down to the fact that 
people with darker hair were classed as not being pure enough, for goodness sakes, under this regime's rules. You know, people, they, I've read enough and seen enough about their studies into the, you know, the size of people's skulls determining their yes. eth- ethnicity and their purity of yes. blood and all that nonsense. And it's just, it's remarkable how these kind of philosophies and beliefs with no scientific principle often rear their ugly heads every 20, 30 years, unfortunately. And I think often we forget when we deal with the horrors of war that children are often at the forefront of it, either through what they see or what they're forced to do or the losses they may suffer from friends and family being taken from them in a variety of ways. And I think... As I said to you right at the beginning, I was really surprised to be caught out by this lady's story because I wasn't expecting it to give me such an insight to small town Germany and the horrors of the rise of Nazism at that period, which you can see as she grows and the the problems spread, unfortunately, through the country and the community. And to then sort of realise when they are gifted shall we say when they're deemed to be of use to the to the ss and the gestapo and the hierarchy in the locality a house where we're never really told what happened to the previous owners but i think it's very clear what happened to the previous owners sadly and it's from that point on that it's as if this young lady at the time seems to be earmarked by whatever reason for things to kind of come through and guide her, Anna, to try and help her deal with the situation and also, as it develops, help her get through this awful situation because after she's managed to kind of fight her way away from what we consider to be a horrible situation, she's then thrust once again into a battle for life and death, dealing not only with her age and the elements, but also the fact that one wrong step, one wrong turn could see her killed. And, you know, Paul, this is the most, to me, the most incredible thing. She said to me the third time we met in person, I don't know why I had been singled out to survive. Mm. Because I felt that entire time that somehow I was being led. And she said when she finally saw that tunnel at the end, it was figuratively almost like a tunnel going from life to death. Because she didn't know what was inside the tunnel. But it was also almost like when I see whatever is in there, is it really alive? Mm. Is the question she had in her head. She started disbelieving herself. Mm. She began to, she began to think because she was progressively starving, Paul. Yeah. She was progressively becoming dehydrated as she was walking. Uh, and you know, these days, not to digress, when we hike through the woods, We've got all all this gear. We've got the backpack and the top and the shoes for $300. We've got all this equipment, all this fancy equipment that we carry to help us, you know, with the GPS and everything. This is just a 14-year-old girl who's never gone on a hike except for the little visits in the meadow with her pupils. Hmm. She had a basket with her of big goods that were given to her by the lady. And on her back was this canvas pack and shoes that were meant um, to be worn when you were out to, to go on some type of a Sunday drive. She wasn't even equipped, Paul. She had nothing on her hmm. that would have helped her with hypothermia. Or any of those elements that you see uh, out there, you, the woods, you know, with, with the weather and everything, everything was against her. Mm. So when I was talking to her, she said, 
you bring back a lot of my memories. And one of the things I thought of after I talked on the phone with you was that somehow I was meant to survive, that I was being led. But, you know, she said, I started really disbelieving what I was saying Hmm. because I thought I was starving and I was always hungry and my feet were bleeding. I had blisters all over and I really didn't think I was going to make it. Hmm. And her father had the similar feeling. You know, he he had obviously a different kind of experience at the onset. And for those who haven't read the book, it's it's a girl who's walking through the forest trying to search for her father. Her father, on the other hand, was going from north to south looking for her. And and the journey takes them from two days after her birthday, her 14th birthday in April, all the way into September, October. So all through this, they were looking for each other and hiding in the woods, trying to remain undetected because both of them had defected, in Mm. essence. Mm. Both of them, one escaped from an installation and the other one escaped the clutches of the Gestapo. Absolutely. I find her strength of character for someone of that age... As as she describes in the early passages, and once again, as I mentioned, we often forget about things like this. We're talking about a teenager who's seen people shot and killed in front of her, including people she knows very well. And it disgusts her, it terrifies her, it frightens her. And we often think that things like this happen on battle fronts, or it's just soldiers that these kind of things happen to, Anna. And I think people forget that... Children, especially in times of war, see the most horrendous things. And what this young lady sees, even before she starts this journey, is remarkable that she's got the strength of character to be able to deal with it and be able to keep moving forwards. Because as 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 you've mentioned there, she doesn't understand or or perhaps she was meant to get through it. And often when you hear people especially in the Second World War, anybody that survived the concentration camps or the great battles that that scarred Europe and and Africa and and Asia. It is remarkable when you sometimes hear these people and they're very matter of fact, Anna. It's almost almost as if they've become extremely detached from things. Um, It's like when you hear people who survived the USS Indianapolis going down, which is just a remarkable story if you've ever had the opportunity to hear anybody talk about that bobbing about in the middle of the Pacific Ocean for 10 days, watching people getting picked off by sharks. And (laughs) we're dealing with a 14-year-old girl who's, who's managed to, as you say, escape the hypocrisy of the Gestapo as well, because that was a really interesting aspect of this, was that they'd got this dyed-in-the-wall Hitler supporter, fully-fledged member of the Gestapo, who is a hypocrite, who, if it was found out about who she really was, she'd be taken away, she'd be put in a camp, she'd be on a train... And it's remarkable, once again, as we as we mentioned earlier, what people did to survive, they would create a persona. And this lady who decided to take her under her wing, shall we say, or probably try and corrupt one of her better students even further, Anna, she's, she's one of the worst hypocrites in the book because she is everything that this regime hates. And yet she's risen to a position of power by pretending to be someone completely different. And that's key to the survival, Paul, because it seems like under their noses, there was this woman who could have been otherwise killed. Mm. And because she was of stature, they overlooked, you know, what, how she was living. Yeah. And they're so, uh, I can't even think of the word to use except to say narrow minded that they don't tolerate any kind of lifestyle any any kind of difference Mm -hmm. from what they believe is the only right way and their way is to murder anybody who differences who has differences yep let me ask you this and and i'm so happy you read the book because i puzzled over this as i was writing it 
Um, and eventually I asked the, the young woman who is now an elderly lady, what do you make of this? What, where, what do you think it meant? The handkerchief. Yes. I found that quite odd. It's, there are, there are a lot of sort of tokens in this story. Anna, that, that there are things that happen and incidents and I suppose for those of us who are open minded would say that they are signs or um portents of of things. And I found that aspect of it very curious. As well as the fact that when she leaves the clutches of the Gestapo, the ease in which she's allowed to go, it's almost as if that this woman understands that what she is, everything that she's led this lady to believe is is nonsense. It's all a lie. She's a hypocrite of the of the highest order. And so th the handkerchief itself, for me, I don't know whether it's um, a sign of support or uh, it's it's a token of of good luck. It's it's curious. And so, Paul, I I thought of this as I was writing it. I sent her an email and I said, when you first saw this in the chicken coop, you know, at that farm, mm. when she finally gets the courage because she was so thirsty, she could smell the water. She finally comes down off her hiding place with the fear of being detected. She she had to survive. She had to get a drink. She ends up inside this enclosure where there were chickens and the young girl apparently had been feeding the chickens and then she was trying to give them water and then she was summoned by her mother or who seemed like she was her mother and there a young girl comes down and she goes in and in this enclosure she finds the handkerchief and I said to her what was the first thing that came to mind and she said, of course, I thought my mother was there, that someone had somehow rescued my mother. Mm. And she was there at the farm. So when I saw it, I was so besides myself. She didn't take it as a sign. She literally thought her mother was there at the farm. Yeah. Well, it's interesting as well, because she thinks when she sees the other girl, she thinks that's somebody else as well. So it's almost as if she was led to that point, Anna. It's as yes. if, as if she was meant to find it. And maybe, maybe she was, maybe, as we said, it was a sign that she was doing the right thing, that she would get through it and she had to get there, but she would never have found it if she'd not misidentified the young girl who was feeding the chickens, because the only reason she goes there is she thinks it's somebody else. That's what pulls her out, isn't it? Yes. And we'll never know, Paul. At the end of the day, she doesn't really know if this girl is the girl she thinks that it is mm. or if it was somebody else. Mm. And years and years later, she still wonders, was that all a hallucination or was it what I experienced for real? Mm. Was I really being helped? And I said, well, it remains that you're here. If that had not happened, where have you, where would you have been? Mm -hmm. Very true. And you know, Paul, she couldn't answer me. Mm -hmm. She really just, she was just very perplexed and it made her very religious. Mm -hmm. It is interesting as well that her father has a very similar incident where when you read it, it's only when you get to the end that you realize what he's seen, Anna. Um, and it's once again, he seems to come across something that's, that, that's a sign in his situation. It's a German shepherd and this, when he meets this dog and that whole incident, it's almost as if he's watching a replay for whatever reason, because he's no connection to this incident. He doesn't know anybody that was there. He's not from that particular area. He stumbled across something and he sees the most horrific things. Once again, there are lots of aspects of this story from this lady and her family that shock you, that surprise you. And that's before we even get into the supernatural, Anna. That's, <laughs> that's what really <laughs> caught me on, on the hop because war and, and the ramifications of it are horrifying enough. Adding ghosts and signs and portents and supernatural assistance to it just takes it to a different level. And I, the more I read it, 
the more compelling it became because you just kind of think, as she seems to believe, that it's as if somebody or something was looking out for her because clearly, even before it all goes horribly wrong, things start appearing. And it's very interesting that we often get this situation where the father is clearly a very sceptical person, whereas the mother and the daughter are, are very much of a belief in the supernatural, whereas the dad's very, no, 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 you, you're tired. It's the trick of the life. Yes. It's shadows. It's it's any, you know, it's your imagination. But the mum the yes. and the daughter aren't having it at all. Um, <laughs> and to be fair, <laughs> it's probably a good job because I think it's this open-mindedness that she's inherited from her mother I think that gives her this strength and this ability to to deal with with what happens in a more positive way because you know these are horrendous challenges to deal with and it's almost as if she's being led through it all for whatever reason to make sure she gets through it I think and it's it's remarkable that when also you deal with the the age of this lady now, that I suspect that she has hardly told anybody about this, even the bits prior to her journey to find her father, Anna, because you're talking about fourteen year old people seeing their neighbours shot in the throat. These are not these are not pleasant memories for the best of people. I don't care how tough you think you are, these are not pleasant things to talk about in any stretch of the imagination. Paul, I've got something for you, and I hope you're sitting down. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> After I got this book finished, I asked her if I should put her in the acknowledgments, and that's when she said, you can if you want to, but I prefer you didn't. All I want from this is a signed copy of the book. And she said, here's the other piece. We've been talking in confidence uh, without my daughter here. She has a daughter, mm. and her husband has passed away since then. And, of course, her father passed away, um, I think it was like five or six years after they moved to this area. She said that her father became a believer mm. after he went up to that ridge and heard that line of people being shot by the river. Mm. Her father, who was a skeptic, told her in the first year, when they were in Austria, that now he believes everything she had been saying. You know, because prior to this, she was a very sensitive person, if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, sometimes she can read what people are going to say before they say it. And he would laugh it off and all that, you know, the skeptic that you caught on to. But after the incident where he peered through the ridge, the trees in the cups of trees and saw the line of soldiers shooting at the people and the soldier that walked up close to him that didn't see him. Or I don't know. I don't really know. After that episode with the gentleman shooting himself in the head, that replay for his benefit, I think, he became a believer. Mm. Well, if you know, if that doesn't convince you about the, the possibilities of the paranormal, Anna, seeing something like that, I don't know what would, because that that's what I'm saying. There are so many aspects of this. When you read these reports, that, that one's one of my favourite sections of the book, primarily because you don't realise what's happened until he starts to think, well, I've got no blood on me. How's that happened? I've just seen somebody kill themselves in front of me and uh, there's nothing there's nothing here what's what's how's that happened how's this and then obviously he falls down and just collapses into a into a very deep slumber because of his, his exertions just getting to that point and, and it's only when he comes around that he realizes what's happened and it's it's full of little aspects of it like that that it's only in the telling of the story do you realize the ramifications of what we are watching unfold because clearly what what reason there was for him to stumble across that scene to see it? And you think, well, has that happened to anybody else that had that unfortunate situation of being in that particular place at that particular time or or whatever? Was it was it a replay that he was seeing? Why was he showing it? He didn't know any of these people. He didn't know the soldier that that took his own life. No, 
it had no relevance to him as a no as a person. He was just a passerby. He was just there because he happened to be in hiding and he was making his way. Um, and and here's the thing, Paul. This is the part where you have to be sitting down with all this his stories to her, to Krista, that she also somehow, you know, wrote down. She said she did write down some of this somewhere. She never shared any of this with her own daughter. So all this that we are talking about, I just sent her a copy of the book. Hmm. She is going to share with her by handing her the book. Hmm. So you're right. Not many people know. I was one of the very few who really knew what had gone on with her hmm. or her father. Yeah. Her daughter, I don't know how she's going to receive it. I've not met her, but she, she is going to have her read it. She said it was very painful mm -hmm. in some ways for me to relive what I have told you. Mm. And I'm not going to do it again. Mm. But I want her to sit and read it. Mm. So she understands how far I have gone because she felt like when she finally got to the border that she had changed so much mm. as a person and her perspective had changed 180 degrees by the time they walked into freedom. And, you know, it wasn't really that straight a path either. But when they got there, you know, they, they still had things they needed to do. But the Russians were closing in. They were really... They were very afraid for themselves still because, you know, Austria was on the side of the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But she kept it close to her breast and so did her father until about several months later when they finally sat down and they recounted all the things to each other. And she saw how much her father had changed. Mm -hmm. So it should be interesting how her daughter receives the book. Mm. I'm I'm not surprised, Anna, to be honest, because I've heard that a lot from people in the UK whose families went to places or fought in the war or even where I live here in Sheffield, which was heavily bombed by the Nazis at the beginning of the war. Um, incredibly, where the house I sit in as we speak, Anna, was rebuilt in 1950 because next door... Uh, a bomb fell and killed every single person in it, killed seven people. The area I live is interesting because there are lots of houses that don't fit because they were blown up 70 years ago, 80 years ago, when we were when we were bombed at 7.30 at night. Cinemas were bombed. The Half the city burnt down in two two raids that occurred here where I live in Sheffield, my hometown. It was something that I've never really taken on board until... I was discussing it when we first moved here, Anna. And it's it's incredible how it suddenly takes you back and you realise just what happened to so many people in so many places. And often when you speak to the, the grandchildren or their children of these people, they will say that their parents very rarely mentioned it, if at all. So I'm not surprised, Anna, that her and I would imagine her father that was the same that they never really spoke about what they'd been through and what they'd seen because it must have been awful. And you know, Paul, the the other reluctance here is that she lives in a place where people would probably think she had gone nuts. Mm. But somehow she um, hallucinated the whole thing. An entire week of her life in hiding in a spot on the planet. That's obscure. Hmm. And if you go on Google Earth, the forest that she's talking about, some parts of it are still there. Hmm. And she said it was in the midst of that that she came upon this farm. It was a working farm. It was very much intact. The animals, the, the people that were there. And so that's the other reluctance the other thing that she's still to this day grappling with. Mm. And I know I'm being nebulous because I don't want to give it all away. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> but it, it, you know, when, when I asked her, you know, has anyone has anyone sat down with you besides your father to talk about all these things? She said no, because he went through it, I went through it, and to some extent, that boy, you know, with the cot, mm. he he doesn't really know how he came upon. You know, this is a very heavy cart without a horse, and he was able to carry it.、Mm. It was as if it was another totem, yeah, another another symbol that they were being helped.、Mm. It's it is so perplexing and fascinating. Like I say, I can heartily recommend it because not only is this story incredible, I think it also shows you the the resilience and power of love. In a terrible, terrible time, because I think even if you were talking about two adults trying to find each other, Anna, in a circumstance like this, it would be incredible. But for a father and daughter, a teenager, a girl barely fourteen, dealing with these situations and this supernatural guidance and these almost spiritual manifestations, and the same for her father as well, it it makes you wonder how many other. Stories like this are out there of people that were saved or guided or protected in in trying and terrifying circumstances because they were not the only people going through this. They were not the only people walking to freedom. I mean, this is the other thing. You say, "Oh, walk to freedom." You know, we're talking hundreds of miles. We're not talking that you know a quick five <laughs>、yeah. mile jaunt, Anna, across、yeah. across a field.、Yeah. We're talking, you know, Germany is a very Rugged country in places, and deeply forested, especially at that time. And and this is the other aspect: there were wild animals everywhere. You know, plenty of wolves and things. So it wasn't as、yes. if, you know, it wasn't as if that that you know they might stumble across a a grumpy fox or something like that. You had packs of wolves in the areas. You know, these were deep, dense, dark, dangerous woods that these people were having to. To survive in, and not knowing the the foliage that was available, the food they were they were living on their wits. On top of everything else, it's a remarkable story. And you know, it's very strange, Paul. The whole time, she was more knowledgeable with the type of things that she could eat because she was close to her mother while her father was working. Her mother was showing her all these things in the garden that were edible. You know, when when you're pulling weeds. Things you shouldn't be eating that's growing there. She showed them, so she knew what was toxic and what was a weed that was edible, and it helped her. He, on the other hand, had no idea. He had a, a, a he had a craft that didn't take him out to the woods. You know, he was a tailor, and here he was, and and then suddenly a dog materializes, not in the best of circumstances.、Uh, You know, later on he sees a field that's got corpses all over it, but this dog <laughs> leads him and helps him.、Mm, yeah. I think he easily. I think she, because she was younger, she was more knowledgeable, probably had a little bit more of an edge. I don't think he did at all.、Mm. So I was really amazed, truly amazed. Yeah. How he made it. Yes, it's remarkable. Like you say, she seemed better equipped. To deal with、yes. the circumstances and the situation than he did, which is which is strange when you're talking about a teenage girl compared to a, to her father. But、uh, yeah. as you say, he was a tailor. That's all he knew. Whereas she helped her mother in the garden and did the weeding and and the, dealt with the crops and picking fruit and vegetables and things. And she knew what was what and helping her mother from what was she saying four or five years old. She was helping her mother in the kitchen preparing dinner. Yeah, which is, which is remarkable. It's one of those things that we look back on and you think, how on earth are we letting toddlers peel potatoes? <laughs> you know, it's crazy, but that's how it was. Yes. How did you feel, Anna, when you when this lady spoke to you about this? How does I suppose when, as you mentioned a moment ago, that she was dealing about how painful this is, looking back on, I suppose, and obviously it brings back the loss of. Of lots of people that were close and dear to her as well, and I suppose there's often sometimes a situation of survivor's guilt, which we、mm-hmm. hear in in lots of situations, especially when things like this, as 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 you've mentioned, that why me? How did I survive? Why did I survive? Has she been able to to find some peace with it? Because I mean, as you say, she's never 
really spoken about this. So I suppose opening up about it is is distressing because it's it's bringing it all to the fore again. Has it allowed her to kind of take a bit more comfort in it, Anna, or is she still? Tra- oh, well, I would imagine most people would be traumatized by this, but has it enabled her to kind of gain a little more peace in regards to what happened and and the things that went on? I think she has. The impression I have is there is a certain level of detachment mm. until something in the conversation in her narrative hits a chord. Yeah. And then she, I remember her going in the kitchen and said, I, I really need to take a break. Mm. And I said, okay, I wasn't rushing her or anything. And, and she went in the kitchen and she was puttering about and I sensed that she was crying. And it, it was uncomfortable for me in the sense that I didn't really know her very well. I'd been told about her for several months to approach her. There was never a forum for it until that dinner time. And then when she met me in person, I, I guess she felt comfortable. She must have felt comfortable around me mm. and then proceeded to tell me a little bit. And, and the night was growing late. The dinner was way done and. And she had a ride at the time because the restaurant was far from where she was living. Yeah. So the, her ride was waiting. She was eager to tell me more. And that's how it led to this book, because then we were contacting each other. And then finally, I went to her house a couple of times that I was there. She was just almost like she was just touring me around the house and you know, showing me things that she'd collected, you know, because, you know, I I like antiques and she was also collecting antiques. Mm. So for a little bit of time, we took comfort in digressing to that until finally she sat down and she said, well, I suppose you do have a drive home, so I, I need to keep telling you. And that's when she started really unraveling the story and telling me. But there's a detachment, Paul, kind of like a far away look. Mm. Because it's almost like you have to separate yourself Mm. from what had happened to you. And then on the final time we talked, she was telling me that she was flying to Germany. She was going to just see about a distant relative. I never did find out who it was, but I I know she did go. Mm. And then it was a few months later when I called her and I said, well, how did that go? And. And she said, you know, I realize now where I came from, but I still don't understand how it was possible for me to have done what I did. Hmm. Yeah, it's remarkable. It really is remarkable. And I commend you on pulling it together in the way that you did, because as I said to you right at the very beginning of this conversation, and I was not expecting a book like this at all. And I don't mean that disrespectfully to your previous work or our conversations that we've had. But as I began to read it, it it just drew me in because unfortunately, you know what's going to happen. You can kind of see the situations that will occur, the changes that are about to happen. And it's it's almost as if she's in the center of a whirlwind with all this going on around her. And I just didn't expect it. And I was quite... I was quite pleased when the first ghost turned up because I thought, oh, thank God. <laughs> we've, we're, <laughs> we're away from the real horrors of the world, you know, if that yes. makes sense. It, it kind yes. of, I found it quite comforting when a ghost turned up to, and she sees one. And I just thought, oh, thank goodness for that. Because I think often we forget that the real horrors in life can often be people. Yes. And, and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your compliment. So, I mean, it's, it's a great read. The Way Through the Woods. How has it affected you, Anna? Because this is obviously a very, it's a very deeply personal story, a very moving story, a very tragic story in a lot of instances. But it's also pierced with a lot of optimism and strength and courage and love. It's, I would imagine it's a very challenging book to look back on and think how it makes you feel because it, it, I suppose it's, it's very difficult when you've got such extremes of emotions that this lady has unburdened herself of to to look at and think you know there for the grace of god go i you know paul it, writing it was the easy part because i knew i knew the ending mm. 
listening to it was the most difficult part for me. Yeah. Understanding what she went through was very difficult for me because I was at a loss as to what to say. Mm. Some of it resonated with me because I know how my grandmother felt uh, at the time of the war when she and her children were under threat uh, on the other on the other end of the world. Obviously, mm-hmm. what my grandfather went through as a war veteran. From that perspective, I could relate. But I've never seen it from the ground as she led me in this very personal journey. I felt like I was right next to her, and at some point, I felt like I was right next to her father. The scene where the, sh- the soldier shot himself mm. just yards away from the father. When she was telling me that, uh, I could almost, I could smell the blood, I could smell the gunpowder. I could feel myself uh, shivering internally mm. a- a- and even externally. Um, and I think it was in the summertime when she was telling me this. It was probably, it was it was hot outside. Mm. And we were actually sitting outside. And, and But it it froze me. Yeah. It, it froze me and made me think, it, it, this is just simply horrible Mm. i was fascinated but i was also terrified Mm. so it was the telling to me that really made an impression and as i was going back to write the through line of the book because i really didn't even have i had her notes but you know some writers write with some kind of a outline in Mm. mind I really didn't. I just went from what she said from page to page. And I was reliving how she felt hmm. at the time. And I think that made it very personal for me. And I think you're experiencing what I experienced, uh, as she was telling me, is, is what I was striving for. I wanted the reader to understand the enormity of what was going on. Oh, absolutely. And I think you you encapsulated the emotions and the terrifying situations and the realistic parameters that this young lady found herself in. As you were mentioning about the father, I have to say, I, I had a picture in my mind of that incident as I was reading it. I could see this young German soldier. I had my my brain had created a an image to go with the words as I was reading along and I could all, I could see it I could see the scene I could see this ridge I could see his view it was incredible maybe that's because of my my knowledge of the situation of how the conflict of war was playing out at that period the the situations that were occurring in towns and cities and villages across Europe at that point as as much as I mentioned earlier on some of the horrible things that happened in this country we were very fortunate to be an island at that point um, because we would have yes. unfortunately probably witnessed far more and who God knows yeah. what would have happened um, yes. if if they hadn't got past the Channel Islands and, and got stuck there, <laughs> thankfully. So yeah. uh, it's, oh. uh, as, as I say, it's, it's a remarkable piece of work and it's a, an incredible story from this, from this woman. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful that you've had the opportunity to tell her tale because I think it, it definitely deserves to be, told and it deserves to be read and it deserves to remind us of the of the futility of bigotry and isolation and should show us the dangers of following someone without any questioning of their authority or their beliefs because i think we sometimes forget the past and that leads us to making mistakes in the present you know paul i've been through some places in Europe and this country somehow I somehow don't feel comfortable going to. Mm. I had the intention of going, as a matter of fact, as I was writing the book. I was so intensely curious about the lay of the land Mm. and I thought this would make me more effective in writing it if I could see it for myself. Mm. And you know, most of it was bombed, so Mm. it would have changed. Yes. And she said to me, 
the cities all look different. There are some things that have remained, and she was telling you about the little towns and how some of them have blossomed and gotten bigger because of, you know, new buildings and mm. the population. And she said, but the woods, the woods are still there. Mm. <laughs> you know, just to add some levity, I said to her, I don't think I want to go through those woods. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, uh, yeah. Well, if you do, you go through them in the daytime. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass through them by train, but I won't even, <laughs> I won't even look out the window. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Well, Germany is one of my favorite countries in Europe. It's fabulous. I've, I've had the pleasure of visiting several of its major cities and I, I, have a lot of time for the country and its and its people and its culture. It's uh, it's a remarkable place and its rebirth in the years since the war has been quite remarkable. And um, and it's also wonderfully hot in the summer, which is one of those marvelous things. But I do love many of its Whoa. its places and its history. So it is a I recommend it. But stay away from the woods and visit the other places, Anna, and you'll be fine. <laughs> it is a mar wonderful place, Germany, I have to say. It's one of my favourite countries in Europe. I love it. That's good to know. So I'll have to put it on my list. Oh, definitely, especially for such a seasoned traveller as yourself, Anna. I, I try. I try. <laughs> you know, the COVID has put a damper on it, but, you know, yeah, hopefully yeah, yeah. next year. Yeah. I'm expecting a world tour from you next year, Anna. Make up for lost time. <laughs> that Paul <laughs> <laughs> ah, so so speaking of the future Anna what's next for you uh, what's your next project and and what have you got planned coming up well I'm actually uh, scribing a book uh, it's an anthology of five stories um, if you recall Porto my first book it was an anthology of stories mm -hmm. uh, this time around it again is and this is also nonfiction uh, this was an inspiration from years ago, way, way back. And I dredged up uh, some of the accounts that I do recall and got in touch with a couple of the people. One of the stories begins with my own experience with a wing chair. It's a Queen Anne wing chair that's beautifully brocaded and what they call ashes of roses pink. Uh, and I start with that story about what happened when I gained possession. Uh, of this beautiful, what I thought was an antique. Well, it might still have been. Mm. I no longer have it for good reason, Paul. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I was an undergraduate at the time. I brought it into my dormitory, expecting it to be just a piece of furniture uh, and got into an, an interesting adventure with it. Uh, so I start my book from there, and I'm currently uh, trying to get some permission to get a photo of a haunted object. Hmm. So the book is about antiques uh, and the things that unwittingly inhabit them uh, for owners who cannot let go uh, of their coveted object. So that should be coming out sometime in the in the spring or late spring uh, from Beyond the Freight Publishing. And I have to say in advance, thank you so much for my publishers, the wonderful people and the editorial people there. Uh, they're just marvelous what magic they do with these books. Absolutely. So The Way Through the Woods is available through Beyond the Freight, is it not? Yes, and also on Amazon. Uh, it is available in Kindle and also in paperback. Fantastic. I recommend it, Harry. Like I say, it's a, it's a deeply moving and compelling book. And as I joked earlier, you'll be glad when the ghosts turn up because, by heck, that's a period of history I think none of us need to forget. But going back and reading first-hand reports of it really does bring it home sometimes and you forget just how brutal it could be, especially when it's told through the eyes of a child, Anna. So... Thank you so much for bringing this story to us and I wish you the very best for the new year and hopefully we will speak again. Thank you so much, Paul. And yes, we will be updating, you know, hopefully next year when the next book comes out uh, and they have a good, wonderful holiday and happy new year to you too. And the very same to you and yours. Thank you as always, Anna. Thank you. Have a good night.